Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Doug Elmendorf, the Dean of Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the Kennedy School and to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm glad that so many people could be here in the room today and that others are watching over the live stream. We're gathered for a panel discussion titled Hamas and Israel, what happened, what does it mean, what's next? I wanna begin by acknowledging, highlighting that this discussion will be very difficult for some, maybe many people who are watching and are here today. I've talked over the past week with students at the Kennedy School um, who have had family members who have been killed. I've talked with students who have loved ones who are in fear for their lives. I've talked with students who have been themselves subject to threats and vitriol for things they have said. So the events of the past week have been searing for all of us who have been paying attention, but especially personal uh, for many of our colleagues and friends. I think it's the responsibility of universities, the responsibility of the Kennedy School at this time to take on hard issues and to do so with rigor, uh, substance and evidence, but also with compassion. Compassion for people for whom these issues are not abstract. Um, they're not things one reads about from afar. They're things that are personal that one lives. Um, I hope we can bring that spirit to today's discussion and to the many discussions that I think we need to have and will have in the days and weeks and months ahead. So thank you for that spirit. Our moderator today is Professor Tarek Massoud. Professor Massoud is the Ford Foundation Professor of Democracy and Governance here at the Kennedy School. Uh, he's the co-editor of the Journal of Democracy, which is published by the National Endowment for Democracy. Professor Massoud's own research focuses on political development in Arabic-speaking and Muslim-majority countries. Um, he is the director of the Kennedy School's Middle East Initiative. I'm very grateful to him for arranging this panel discussion on short notice, and I'm grateful to the guests whom he has invited for agreeing to be here on short notice. We are privileged to have them here and have this opportunity to learn from them. Uh, Professor Massoud will introduce them, so please join me in welcoming Professor Tarek Massoud and our guests. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dean Elmendorf. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, the events of the last week, I think, will be forever burned into our collective memories. Uh, whatever one's take or position on the thorny issues that constitute the uh, never-ending, seemingly never-ending struggle between Israelis and Palestinians, the indiscriminate murder of civilians the taking of hostages, the threats to execute those hostages, these have caused all of us to shudder in horror. But as we mourn the dead innocence of the state of Israel, we also fear what is to come for the people of Gaza. The Netanyahu government has shut off Gaza's water supply and its electricity. It's ordered a civilian evacuation of the northern part of the territory in preparation for what one Israeli general called in the early uh, days of this conflict, opening the gates of hell. Um, neither Egypt nor Israel is willing or able to take in the hundreds of thousands of uh, Gazans who need to escape the military operations to come. And the result is, a, is potentially a humanitarian crisis of profound gravity with the potential to cost thousands of lives and to inflame sentiments across the Arab region. And in fact, already we are beginning to see demonstrations throughout the Arab and Muslim world. 
It's not, however, just sentiments that risk becoming inflamed. Reports are trickling in of the role that the Islamic Republic of Iran may have played or its proxies may have played in enabling what happened last Saturday. And it's possible that if those uh, reports were verified, we could see ourselves uh, it facing a situation where Israel feels compelled to respond militarily to what it would deem as a clear act of war. We're already hearing some Iranian uh, proxies in Yemen and Iraq threatening to get involved. Already Hezbollah and uh, Israel are trading artillery fire on the southern Lebanese border. And so as horrible as it is to contemplate and as horrible as the situation already today is, we may soon find that the theater of war has been widened far beyond Gaza, far beyond Israel, with the potential to swallow up the entire region. So to help us understand what happened, what it means, and what the future has in store for the people of Israel, Palestine, the Middle East, and the world, we're joined by three very distinguished individuals who know this region and this conflict intimately. They generously agreed on very short notice, as Dean Elmendorf said, to dedicate some of their scarce time to educating all of us uh, about uh, this issue, and I could not be more grateful. The first is Ambassador Edward Jurigian. Ambassador Jurigian served under George Herbert Walker Bush as our ambassador to Syria. He was the Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, and in the Clinton administration, he served as our ambassador to the State of Israel. I'm also proud to say that he is a senior fellow of the Middle East Initiative here at the Kennedy School. Uh, the second person I will introduce is Professor Shai Feldman, who's on the very far end. He's the Raymond Frankel Professor of Israeli Politics and Society at Brandeis University's Department of Politics. He's the author of several books, including Arabs and Israelis, Conflict and Peacemaking in the Middle East with Khalil Shikaki and Abdul Munam Saeed Ali. Finally, I want to introduce Professor Shibli Talhami, the Anwar Sadat Professor of Peace and Development at the University of Maryland. He is a prolific and award-winning author and the editor most recently of The One State Reality, What is Israel-Palestine? We have an hour allotted for tonight's event, of which we have already extinguished several minutes. So I, I would like us to dive in. And what I'll do is I'll ask questions of each of our distinguished panelists in the hope of sparking a conversation. And then I will open it up to questions from you, our uh, distinguished audience. But let me start now with Ambassador Jurigian. So, Ambassador, you spent your entire life working, or most of your life, working on this region. And in 1992, you gave a speech, a very famous speech, and one of the things you did in that speech is you offered one of the clearest articulations of American interests in the region. You said the two major American goals are a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace between uh, Israelis and Palestinians, and the second, viable security arrangements that will ensure stability and the free flow of oil. And I want to ask you, on Saturday, did Hamas just definitively put the first of those goals, peace between Israelis and Palestinians, definitively out of reach? Thank you, Tarek. What Hamas did is certainly shift the whole political landscape of the Middle East. This is one of the most consequential confrontations between Israel and, and may, may call it an Arab entity, in the case of Palestinian group Hamas. In my long diplomatic career, and I served from John F. Kennedy to Bill Clinton, to give you an idea how old I am, um, but, uh, but there's a saying in the Middle East, I'm so old I can remember the Dead Sea when it was only sick. <laughs> <laughs> but fundamentally, in my long experience, there have been traumatic events in this region that where the danger is so replete and all the negatives are so replete that we have to live through the horrors. And we're living through a great horror right now. But 
These catalytic events often in diplomacy lead to opportunities. And from my vantage point, and it may seem like an illusion right now, what we're witnessing is so consequential in stirring the chessboard of the Middle East that it may, and I, this is the only word of hope I have tonight, that it may lead to a shifting of configurations of groups and countries that there may be another opportunity for diplomacy to arrive at an Arab-Israeli peace agreement, an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement. Now, having said that, that requires leadership. That requires leadership on all sides. I'm going to be very blunt in my opinion. I think we have a deficit in leadership today. I'm not going to name names, but there's a deficit of leadership. But I have seen when leaders are ready to take the risks for peace, things can happen. We're far from that now. We're going to go through a very troubled and dangerous period. And as you indicated, Tarek, the risks of this confrontation expanding are real. Mm. I don't think it's in the immediate interest of the various parties to see that happen. But once you enter into the fog of war, miscalculations, we can get into a regional confrontation that will be quite defining for the future of the Middle East. But to answer your question very directly, I, I think what, what has happened has furthered the prospects for, for peace because hatred, vengeance is in the air. Mm. And we're, going, we're seeing that as we speak. It's a humanitarian disaster on all sides. Uh, and people are not ready to sit down and see the uh, political horizon. And let me just say one last thing mm. here. When, again, in my experience, when there is not a political horizon out there mm. that at least is being talked about or aspired to, for peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians, bad things happen. I want to come to you, Professor Tilhami, and ask maybe a question that um, is on a lot of people's minds. It's not a terribly uh, a theoretically sophisticated question. Why did Hamas do this? Um, first of all, let, let me just start uh, by saying um, this is really a moment to uh, come to terms with uh, our common humanity. Uh, honestly, before I even talk about the analysis, because I think, you know, I know that many of you have been watching what's taken place. Many of you may have lost loved ones or know people who have lost their lives. And many of us find it hard to sleep uh, watching a child get killed, innocent people get killed uh, or taken hostages, whether they're Jewish or Arab, Israeli or Palestinian. It's been a devastating week. It has been one that where our focus should be on our common humanity. Um, and I think that, um, you know, for me as a student of war and peace, um, of course I know what happens in wars. I know that hearts darken. Uh, I know that people demonize. I know that one is obsessed with their own safety and own interest. Uh, and too blinded to see the suffering of the other. And this is the moment where we are. Uh, we've seen the thousands of Israelis who've been killed and wounded and the hostages that were taken. We now are witnessing the devastation in Gaza. We've already had over 8,000 people in Gaza either killed or wounded. As of yesterday, 300,000 people uh, were made homeless. And this obviously is only the beginning not the end. And I think this is the moment for all of us, uh, whether we're scholars, uh, whether we're human beings of any, any, within any position, but especially our political leaders, uh, to take the moral high ground, to rise above the demonization, rise above the hardening of the hearts, to take the responsible path, uh, to speak truth, even to friends, even to people you want to assure, even with people you want to hold hands with. I understand the urge. We all do. We all study war. It's not just Israelis and Palestinians. We know it. But this is a time when we need to rise above that, both as scholars, as leaders, anybody with influence, to 
call the wrong for what it is, to take a moral position. Uh, there is no avoiding that. There is no cause in the world that would justify targeting or recklessly endangering civilians. And I don't care whether that's a Jew or an Arab, a Palestinian or Israeli, an American or an Iraqi. Uh, this has to be a principle that we all uphold. And we have to have that as a starting point. And what we see now is a total devastation. And we need from our own leaders to see leadership, moral leadership above the political leadership, not just the strategic thinking that um, you know, um, uh, is being talked about with planning ahead, uh, thinking about the, 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 what, what Ed said, yes, there might be an opportunity down the road when they come. But so much suffering is on the way, and we need to start with that. So I, I, want, to, I want to make that clear. Number two, let's, not, let's be careful. Mm. Um, let's be careful so no one makes a mistake here. Because we are academics. We explain. We're social scientists. We're not giving, when we are explaining something why it happened, we're not saying it's justified. Explanation is not justification. But if we don't explain, then we are doomed. If we don't understand the core reasons for things that happened, we are doomed. We got to differentiate between justification and explanation. So nothing justifies what Hamas did. Mm. And in my opinion, nothing justifies jeopardizing thousands of, of, of civilians in, in Gaza. And uh, I think those things that we have to be clear morally. But when you look at it, the puzzle for Hamas's attack honestly was not that they're capable of doing it. They've done many things in the past, not on this scale. So the real puzzle honestly was, how did they have the capability to do it? And how did the Israelis fail A, to detect it and to prevent it? And that's really the puzzle. It's, that's the puzzle of the timing. Now from my point of view, if I'm looking at their calculus to the extent that there was a timing related to their action, uh, I'm looking at what's happening, the occupation. Again, remember, justification and explanation are not one and the same. Uh, there is no way that you can uh, say that the, the despair that prevails um, in the West Bank, not just in Gaza, where there's a blockade. I was there last week. I was in Israel and the West Bank. Uh, the amount of despair is enormous, in part because it's been 56 years of occupation. Uh, and they have not been able to do anything. And today, the chance of, another st of an independent state of Palestine is much lower than it was 10 years ago. And they're looking at no hope in sight. They were hoping the Biden administration will be different from Trump. They didn't get anything on that. They were hoping that Arab states would exchange peace with Israel for ending of occupation. That l didn't look like that was going to happen. The opposite was going to happen. So there was an enormous amount of despair taken place. And that's when militant groups exploit it. Because if there are no peaceful paths and there's no peaceful hope, as Ed put it, that's the perfect opportunity for militant groups to uh, say, but you see, we can do something about it. You see, we can do something about it. And as you know, as I said, hearts harden in times of war. So in Israel, after you know the, the, the attacks, uh, the horrific attacks, uh, many people said, let's level, let's level Gaza. Let's level Gaza. And in the Palestinian areas, you have people, let them do it. You know, whoever, whatever is, so hearts harden. We have to understand that that's what we have. We on the outside world, we have to grow uh, over it. We have to, uh, our leaders need to speak with, with clarity because vengeance is not a strategy. It's not a moral strategy, and it's not one that could bring results in the end that can bring genuine and just peace in the region. Okay, thank you. So, so did you want to quickly respond I, to I that? I just want to reinforce yeah. what, what Shibley is saying here, especially for our leaders on all sides. If we go down the biblical maxim of an eye for an eye, we're all going to be blind. Um, thank you, Shibley. I want to, I want to, uh, there's a lot to follow up on there, but I want to come to uh, uh, Professor uh, Feldman. So as Shibley, uh, Professor Tilhami mentioned, one of the puzzles is how Israel failed to detect this. The standard line about 
uh, Hamas was that 10% of Hamas uh, fighters were on the Israeli payroll, that Israel had complete visibility into this tiny two mile by 25 mile territory. The um, operation seemed to have required a lot of coordination and a lot of planning that it uh, seems hard for me to imagine that that evaded detection. Um, so how did the Israelis uh, get caught by surprise? First of all, thank you for having me. Um, second, I, I, I um, completely associate myself with the opening remarks of Ambassador Jerejian and, and Shibli Talhami. Uh, we're, we're, we, we're neighbors over there, and uh, we've been in the same graduate school, um, so we're the same product of American academe. For me, uh, this is particularly personal, which makes me almost, in f maybe for the first time in my life, difficult to talk. <coughs> because a year and a half ago, I returned from a three-year term as president of a college uh, that is just outside the town of Sdeot that essentially turned into a killing field. And for the first four days after, since Saturday, <coughs> I've been mostly just trying to find the, the senior administration people that worked with me, were part of my team, were, were my team, and to find out, uh, and, and they are spread in locations that have become battlegrounds, various kibbutzim from Zikim, uh, to Nativa Asa, to, uh, uh, to uh, and of course the Ot, which continues to be a battleground to uh, to this day. So, <coughs> so it's 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 difficult for me to completely disassociate myself from from the personal uh, aspects, but I completely and wholeheartedly um, associate with my, myself with what Shibli said particularly the real need to make sure that we don't confuse explaining uh, with justification. I think that uh, Israel was surprised because uh, it really completely misunderstood. It had basically thought that it has constructed some kind of deterrence equation with Hamas and Gaza. Which, uh, which comprised of both being able from time to time, and there were eight, 2009 and 12 and 14 uh, major military confrontations established its, its, uh, its military capacity to respond. Coupled with an attempt to at least, at least create some kind of a minimal survivability or surviving sit situation in Gaza, that, uh, that would allow the Gazans to have something to lose. But I think that completely misunderstood the nature of deterrence because there is no factor in the deterrence equation that is more important than the issue of motivation. And when you are basically in a, what we have to again speak the truth, Gaza has been a gigantic jail. 2.3 million people who had very, very limited capacity to leave uh, and, and travel and so on and so forth. In reality, and also by international law, whoever controls the exit and entry points to a certain territory is the sovereign. So Israel and Egypt shared in, in some ways Gaza sovereignty. But the idea that the other side, that the, Hamas, that the Gazans and the Hamas guys would, uh, would accept uh, uh, this uh, indefinitely was, I think, a big illusion. By the way, not different from the illusion that, and the source of the basic, basic source of surprise in 1973. What Israelis underestimated that for Egypt, the return of the territory that Israel controlled since the 1967 war was worth the huge costs that President Sadat actually predicted would be associated with the attempt to liberate the territory. It turned out very well for the Egyptians that the, that the, the, the level of casualties was much lower than actually President Sadat thought and was willing for his people to pay for the liberation uh, uh, of these territories. 
And when, when you're dealing with desperate people, you have to expect. And, and, and Israel, I think, completely, I don't think, I, this one I'm sure, completely, completely um, uh, did not understand <laughs> the real nature of, of deterrence and how deterrence is fragile in a situation where the other side has such strong motivation to, to violate. That's the basic surprise. And when you talk about surprises, there are basic surprises and there are situational surprises. And the situational surprise has to do with the fact that Hamas understood or thought that how this is going to turn out in the end regarding that assessment that I think they had, we will see. But I am pretty strongly convinced that Hamas thought that there is a window, a window was created. And that the window that was created had to do with the fact that Israel and the Israeli governing system was, we have to say this, distracted for almost a year since the new Israeli government was formed. It was distracted because the elements in the new Israeli government was try were trying to implement a monumental change in Israel governing system. Uh, most people interpret that, including myself, as an attempt to limit democracy in Israel. At the expense, of course, by doing, by limiting the, f the power of the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis the other branches of government in Israel. And a large chunk of the Israeli population rebelled and, and went to the streets. And we have now, we've had until last Saturday, 40 Saturdays where about a quarter of a million Israelis went to the streets. That's equivalent to 8.4 million Americans protesting Saturday after Saturday after Saturday after Saturday. And the strongest element or the most consequential element of the protesters were Israeli reservists of the best units of the Air Force and the Special Forces and the intelligence and so on and so forth, saying, if you guys continue with this, we are going to, we are going to rethink because much of this reserve service is also voluntary. And they said, we are going to rethink this, and so on and so forth. And then the, the top echelons of the IDF actually were, in, were, because of this, had to deal with, for the last 10 months, with the issue of the readiness of the IDF. Now, guess what was proven in the first Saturday? <laughs> that the IDF readiness was seriously, seriously damaged. And this had to do something with what happened uh, in Israel. On top of that, this new government that Israel had since in the last 10, 11, or 12 years, months, had elements that our President Biden, I think, correctly said, this is the most extreme right-wing government that Israel's had. We had two ministers in the government that were beyond the pale, and my test for the beyond the pale is that no right-wing government in Israel had ever thought of even of including them in the government. And they had played a role in, 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 in the skirmishes and, and the conflicts that, that, that developed between settlers in the West Bank and, and, uh, uh, and Palestinians in the West Bank. And if you want, a, there is no starkest evidence of how, what were the consequences of this, that two days before last Saturday, the Southern Command of the IDF essentially gave the green light to moving three battalions from the South to the West Bank, leaving essentially most of the, most of the, of the settlements or the towns in, 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 in the South uh, uh, defenseless. So it was a combination here of, 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 uh, of essentially the, the components of a basic surprise with the situational surprise that was, was uh, re resulted from the particular circumstances that developed after 10 months of internal struggle in Israel. Now, what is the problem that Israel has? And, and, and here again, we, I go back to just emphasize again and again and again, don't take anything that I said until now as justification. But, it's, but if we run away from looking reality in the face and understand the, the causes, we will not understand how to get out of it. And here I go back to, this, to, 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 my, to the, the last point I wanted to make. 
which is there is a lot of resemblance, as I said, between the strategic surprise and, by the way, its magnitude that Israel suffered now and the strategic surprise that Israel suffered in 73. But there is a monumental difference between the two situations. Because, and the big difference between the two situations is that even beginning two years before 1973, before the war, before the Egyptian forces crossed the Suez Canal, President Sadat began to present Israel with an alternative. Israel at that point still occupied the Sinai until the Suez Canal. And when President Sadat went to Israel to make the point in November 77, his major point was, we understand that you have a legitimate security concern. Let's talk about how we meet your legitimate security concerns in a way that's not at our expense. This is a monumental difference because, because, because Hamas is still committed to Israel's destruction. So even when the, 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 the stated demand is not, you know, go, go commit suicide, but end the siege, then Israel was basically asked to end the siege. By the way, they operationally defined the end the siege. End the siege, for example, is a port. So Israel was supposed to accept the idea of ending the siege and allowing an entity that stated purpose of which is the destruction of Israel to allow, and look at how much, how, how much they managed to, to, to smuggle into, into, into Gaza without having a port and without having an, air, an, air, an airfield. So the, in, in a situation, and this is where Israel is right now, Israel is in a predicament. It doesn't have an Egypt solution. That, 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 oh, please go ahead. Uh, to pick up on Shai's, uh, I think you very well described that Hamas perceived an internal weakness in the Israeli body politic because of what you described in the, uh, the government. I think the other factor is the perception that the Palestinian issue in the region as a whole was being diminished. And you know what the trope is for the last five odd years and more, that the Palestinian issue is no longer a central issue in the Middle East. We have to get on with it. We have to get beyond it. I have said, uh, I'm not talking about this retroactively, I have argued that the Palestinian issue remains a central issue in the Middle East and that transactional arrangements like the Abraham Accords, if they translated themselves in putting influence on the parties to come to an agreement is one thing, but as purely transactional accords are not going to bring forward Israeli-Palestinian peace. And the other factor is that the so-called expansion of those accords to in, include Saudi Arabia and Israel with the active diplomacy of the Biden administration, uh, that was also a signal to Iran that there was a geopolitical strategy to marginalize Iran from the region. And I can't prove this, but I think that must be part of the calculation, because as you know, Hamas is fully supported by, by Iran. So I don't know if you agree with yeah, me or not, that, Well, let me say something about that. I, yeah. I, I have obviously um, uh, you know, thought about that and talked to a lot of people in Washington about it. No question they're supported by Iran. Hamas obviously gets... I'm not saying operational, in, in, well, in, in, well, but I'm no, talking no, about the, support. The, the real question is not whether they get support. Of course they get support. I mean, they're, they're open about it. The, the Hamas is open about it, and, and they get a lot of equipment from them, training, uh, etc. No question. Uh, they're, they're a close supporter. The real issue is not that in there, is whether Iran was behind that attack, and there is no evidence of that. The U.S. has said that. Uh, Israeli intelligence, I understand, uh, have, have not disputed that. Uh, so I think we have to be careful. Why do we have to be careful? Uh, because some, we don't want to be dragged into a war with Iran, and we do know there are some people who wanted us to be dragged into a war with Iran. And we have to be very mindful and worried about that. We also know that we're now involved in a domestic political season. And the Iran issue is very hot. And so uh, the you know, Republicans are attacking the president for the prisoner exchange and releasing the funds and everything else. I, I'm not going to talk about politics here. This is not our issue. But remember, there's a political thing. There are also in Israel, you've got a government, the right-wing government, that obviously has uh, you know, failed to, uh, to, to uh, detect that attack or respond to it, uh, point, pointing finger is very easy uh, for distracting from the responsibilities. So I think we have to be really, really careful about just saying, 
you know, Iran. I was saying uh, it's another factor. I, did, I, did, I wasn't no, no, saying I that Iran. No, no, I understand did, that. No, I, I agree with you yeah, on that. that. I agree. It's I, another I agree. factor. And, but, and but, let me put myself on the line here. <laughs> I think the, Shai, you may not agree with me on this, but I really think that the existential challenge that Israel faces is the Palestinian issue much more than the Iranian issue. I, th I think geopolitically, uh, Iran is a threat to the region and to Israel, but it can be handled in other ways. But the existential threat to the very nature of the state of Israel as a democratic Jewish state is the Palestinian issue. And one thing that this crisis has brought to the fore, that that issue is tragically alive and well. And again, how the pieces are picked up are going to determine the future. I don't disagree with you. Former Prime Minister Barak once said that not having a border between Israel and the Palestinians is a greater existential threat to Israel than Iran. Mm -hmm. But having said this, I want to just give a twist to what you said, because I agree with almost, almost everything you said. Um, it's not just, okay, first of all, where are we? We are at, at this point in a situation of about 10 years where the gap between the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has increased tremendously. We have peace with two Arab countries, we have the Abraham Accords and so on, on, we, on the verge of, and none of this of course resulted in any uh, progress in Israeli-Palestinian. This is the reality. But I would put one twist on what you said. I think the real problem is not that the Arab countries have forgotten about the Palestinians. I think there, was, there is a general fatigue in the region about the Palestinian issue. And I think part of that fatigue results from the fact that Arab states, one after the other, said to the Palestinians, if the struggle with Israel is so important to you, then how come you're spending 90% of the energy fighting among yourselves? And Hamas contributed to this. And we have to remember, everybody was involved in reconciliation efforts, especially the Saudis. Every one of these reco reconciliation efforts among the Palestinians completely failed. And, and basically, you have a situation where the, the Emiratis and the Bahrainis and so on and so forth said, you know, it's, 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 is this really important? You come to us every time that, the, that you have trouble for our help? And we've been helping you and helping you and helping you, and this is how important this issue is? No, that's, a, that's a very valid point. Can I, we, we have only a couple of minutes before I do want to open it up to our fantastic audience. So I want to ask each of you a question, uh, and I'll ask you to answer it briefly, even though each of these questions I'm about to ask were my main questions of each of you. So um, I'll start with you, Professor Tarhami, because something Shai said, there was a contradiction almost in something Shai said where he talked about Gaza uh, as uh, you know, uh, an open air prison, um, a, 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 a very grave situation in Gaza. And, but then later pointed out that Hamas has made no bones about its aim to uh, eliminate the state of Israel. Hamas's aim is not to open up some uh, uh, ports and open up some uh, border checkpoints. It is its stated aim is to make Israel uninhabitable for Jews to recapture the entire thing. And so the, the, the question I have for you is, it's no doubt that Gaza was under siege. The question is, is Hamas's behavior due to the siege of Gaza? Or is the 16-year siege of Gaza born of a recognition that if Hamas has an opportunity, it will engage in this kind of catastrophic terrorism, which after all, we have seen before. This, we, we saw this in the 90s, we saw it during the, the Second Intifada. So how would you respond to that argument? And witness that he wants me to answer that in two minutes. So uh, actually, I uh, said thirty seconds, uh, but you only have thirty uh, seconds. Yeah. Um, two minutes is after the negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> just let me just say uh, a couple of things about that. Um, Hamas obviously is a problem both in terms of the methods it uses and and its objectives for sure, and and that is a dilemma. As as uh, you know, um, Shai put it. He put it as it's a dilemma. How do you deal with that? Um, it's not unusual, right? It's we've had conflicts in the past, so we have rules and, 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 and laws of war about what's legitimate even when you have 
enemies that you think are out to get you related to civilians. So keep that in mind. This has nothing to do with the intensity of attacks in which we results in civilians. So that's number one. Number two, um, uh, Gaza was not paradise before Hamas took over. Uh, Hamas took over in two th 2006. It was still under occupation, and under, under terrible occupation, and it was doing even worse than uh, the West Bank. And, and West Bank isn't a wonderful place right now, obviously for Palestinians, and Gaza is not in control. So let's keep those things in perspective, okay? So, and number three, I mean, the oddity of it is that um, is Israel over time, number one, helped create an Islamist group as a, as a, as a, a, a response to uh, PLO and PLO was seen to be the national movement. And, and Netanyahu has been saying um, more recently even about how useful Hamas is for him politically, not knowing that they have this capability that they obviously came to. So, you know, it's complicated. That's why there's a dilemma. It's very complicated, but it doesn't at all excuse number one, uh, you know, the reckless endangerment of civilians under any circumstances, and it still doesn't take away from the big elephant in the room, which is 56 years of Israeli occupation. I, lo okay. I love Shivali. Yeah. I love Shivali. So do I. But I disagree with him. <laughs> because the issue, the real issue for us right now, I mean, yes, there will be an issue about the intensity of the Israeli response. I agree with that. But that's not really the big issue. The big issue is how do, we, how, do we, how do we come out of this predicament that results from this contradiction? The issue, the, 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 I gave the Egyptian example earlier, but the problem with, that Israel has with Hamas is that Hamas is completely unwilling to travel the road that the PLO traveled from the, from the 74 interim, yeah. interim to the 1988 uh, declaration of independence, they talked about two states, all the way to Oslo. Hamas, by the way, did everything conceivable to, to, to destroy the Oslo agreement. Yeah. Netanyahu's election in 1996 was the result of a massive terrorist, a, a, a series of terrorist attacks to which Prime Minister Peres, who succeeded the Rabin after the assassination, was subjected. Yes. And after that series of terrorist attacks, it was clear that Netanyahu is going to win the election. Yes. The, that's the problem that we have. We have a situation in which a, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an adversary that's not giving you that's not giving you an alternative. You're stuck. And the problem you see here is that it's, this is not Israel. This is not Israel is not in the U.S. in Vietnam. Yeah. Okay, Vietnam. The, the Viet Cong had no claim on America. Yeah. We are not the situation of the NFL in. in FLN, yeah. in Algeria, okay? Yeah, yeah. They did not have a claim on France. They yeah. wanted independence in Algeria. The problem with Hamas is it has a claim on Israel. So Shai, that, and, and as I understand it, the Israelis are saying consequently that their plan now is to eradicate Hamas. They're not just going to mow the lawn to, to echo that heartless euphemism, but they're actually going to rip out the roots. How are they gonna do that in 20 seconds? Well, it's not just... It, it, <laughs> How, how they're going to do that, by the way, is not the bigger problem. Yeah. The big, and not even the, not even the costs involved in doing that, it's not the bigger problem. The bigger problem is that if you, is that, is that to prevent the, the catastrophe of last Saturday, yeah. return, repeating itself, you need to establish some kind of an equation with whoever is going to be in Gaza. Yes. Now, then the question is, and that's called in our, professional life called deterrence. Now the, there is a problem with deterrence, is you need an address. Right. So the real dilemma that Israel faces is not what does it take, what are they, the real dilemma is what's the alternative to Hamas? That's, the, that's, the, that's the, the predicament in which Israel finds itself in. And, and frankly, nobody, and I don't, I really, nobody has an answer to this question. However, Okay, and there is a however. The however actually, the seeds to the answer, and there is an answer, is what Ed Jerigian started with. Mm -hmm. the, the only solution that I see is that, that the Arabs, that Arab states would say, this is too important for the protagonist to leave it to the protagonists. Mm -hmm. we, have, we are dealing here with kinds of children, mm -hmm. and we, the responsible adults, have to get involved. And it's possible that at least for a period, Arab states 
would say, okay, you know, we're taking this over, okay, until we have an alternative leadership in, in, in Gaza and so on and so forth. I can see that if, if, the, if, the Arab, if Arab states, led now by Saudi Arabia, that certainly has the financial capabilities to fuel this, and Egypt with its military capacity has the ability to provide defense, would, 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 would substitute for a party that sticks to its ideological positions, it's unwilling to travel the road that the PLO traveled, and therefore it's not a party. Yeah. A, a lot to say. What, what Shai, say yeah. Go ahead. What, what Shai is basically saying is that deterrence with a group like Hamas simply has failed. And deterrence with a group like Hamas is bound to fail. Mm -hmm. If we look at this from 33,000 feet down, the solution is the end of the 56 year occupation. And that can only be done through political negotiations. And I'll just say one thing, a man who I admired a great deal when I was ambassador to Israel was Yitzhak Rabin. He was the prime minister at the time. And he told me this privately, he obviously has said it publicly. He said, Ed, I'm a military man. I fought all of Israel's wars. There is no military solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm. We have to get to the negotiating table. And if we don't get there, repeat, repeat of the horrors we're witnessing Israel today. Went the extra mile and decided on the negotiation with an, an organization that he felt for years and years and years was a bastion of terrorism. The and, the, and the reason he could do that is because it was an address and it was willing to transform and to reinvent itself, and there is not the slightest indication, indication right. that Hamas is willing to right. travel this road. I agree. Right. I agree. So then, yeah. who, who do you negotiate with? So we, we now, uh, I want to open it up uh, to questions. So I'm uh, in, inviting uh, uh, members of the audience to please uh, cue behind one of the four microphones we have strategically placed um, around the forum. And I want to ask you, when you ask your question, if you could briefly introduce yourself with your name, your school, and your class here, if you're comfortable, because this uh, is being recorded. And I would also like to ask you uh, to keep your question brief so that we're able to field more than one question. And I would humbly say, if you're, if you're thinking about something that starts with, this is more of a comment than a question. Let's you know, reformulate it to be a short question designed to elicit information. And I will start over here. Hello, my name is Izzy Newman Sanders. I'm an MPP2 student here at the Kennedy School. Um, my question is, so the Israeli government has ordered over 1.1 million people to evacuate the northern area of Gaza. Well, you, you're speaking a bit, a bit too fast oh, for, sorry. for me. Uh, the sorry. English is not my first language. <laughs> Uh, and if you could also come closer to the microphone so that yeah. you take full advantage of our first class AV system. Sorry, yeah. is this better? Inshallah. Okay. So the Israeli government ordered over 1.1 million people to evacuate the northern area of Gaza, which includes 500,000 children. This is an act of war, but besides that, Palestinians, Israelis, and even the UN are starting to call what's this an impending genocide. Do you not think it's time for the world, particularly the US, who is a strong, ally and military funder of Israel to step in and stop something that could be a genocide. Thank you. Okay, is the question clear? Yes, it's clear. It's clear and, and yes, the, uh, Israel um, ordered 1.1 million uh, people to evacuate within 24 hours. Um, I just want to say something about that. Um, number one, to call on civilians to leave and then target the, or attack in a way that jeopardizes them does not absolve you of responsibility under international law. We should be clear, that's not enough to, to say, get out, and if they don't, they get hurt, number one. Number two, um, it is impossible. Um, it's just absolutely impossible. Um, why is it impossible? Well, look, I mean, um, in Israel, the Israeli government asked on the people in the settlements uh, uh, around uh, Gaza to, to, leave, to evacuate. And, and many of them didn't know how to do it. There, was, there were no buses, the, the cell phones were closed. And this is in small towns, not very heavily populated, in a very developed country with an infrastructure, and they couldn't get out very quickly, and they were blaming the government for not doing it. When we call on people to uh, you know, evacuate for hurricanes, uh, we, we find we can't even get them out in two or three days, even when we have a real infrastructure in place. So just to think about that you're gonna be able to do that with the blockade 
and no electricity and no transportation and destructions and, and you know, uh, vehicles can't even get to the victims, ambulances are not able to get there. I, I mean, that, that is just, just absolutely impossible, even if they, they had a place to go. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, there is an incredible fear in the Palestinian areas. I mean, Gaza, you know, a majority of Gazans are, are descendants of refugees from 48, from what is now central Israel. Palestinians, as you know, have become refugees more than once, uh, and, and many of them, you know, after 67. And so there's a terrifying, they're terrified by the idea that they would become refugee again to leave the territory. And there's opposition to it, by the way, politically, not just by Hamas. People say, well, Hamas doesn't want them to leave. Um, yeah, of course, Hamas doesn't want them to leave. But to talk to secularists in the West Bank who are opponents of Hamas, talk to um, uh, you know, other Palestinians, they're all terrified of the idea of leaving, even if it were possible. And it's not likely to be happening. So uh, I honestly, this is not something on the horizon now. We need to think about, right now, the immediate issue is, is humanitarian. We need to figure out a way to help people. We got you know, hundreds of thousands of homeless people, hospitals, uh, you know, uh, uh, doctors, uh, 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 the, the, the organizations have, have been saying it's a catastrophe in the hospitals um, without, without the electricity. Um, we need to, the international organization has to find a way to get there and th there has to be a little bit of a pause at least in the bombings for people to get, to get help to, to people who need uh, immediate help. So that's really the issue right now and, and I think we shouldn't you know, get, get distracted by, by these bigger ideas that are not on the horizon anytime soon. Okay, let me take some more questions just so that we, uh, over here, please. Hi, my name is, Hi, my name is Ivana Duny Yang, and I'm an MPP student here at HKS. Um, how do you think the Israeli public will react that now that the Israeli extremist government led by Netanyahu, who has several corruption claims surrounding him, has ignored the safety of captured civ civilians and instead focused on intensifying air raids on Gaza, killing numerous of them? How do you think the Israeli public will react once the war ends? That's a question for you, Sean. I, I think that uh, Israel uh, will experience a major, major, major reckoning. Uh, and it's at the, at, the, at the very least would be the kind of reckoning that went on, that took place in Israel uh, after the previous strategic surprise that I mentioned, which is 73. Um, in, initially, uh, Israel has a kind of a very strong uh, institutionalized uh, system of, uh, in a way of uh, examining itself. Uh, it's perfected the art of national commissions of inquiry. And the national commission of inquiry that was created after the 73 war basically sacked the entire top echelons of the Israeli defense uh, community and not the political leadership. Mm -hmm. And that didn't hold for more than four or five months because the public demanded that the people, all the people that are re responsible for the surprise, for the strategic surprise, in all its aspects, political and economic and military, would, 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 would answer. And, 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 and that led to the, the, the fact that the Prime Minister, Golda Meir, and the, def and the Defense Minister, Moshe Dayan, basically had to end their political career. So I don't see, and I, and I think to some extent, um, <laughs> because so much of this was at least affected by this window of vulnerability that was created and created by the political leadership of Israel, who were warned time and time again by the, the Israel's defense chiefs that take, they cannot continue to sustain a, an, an attempt to change uh, Israel's democracy and diminish Israel's democracy given the level of opposition that this created without it going to result in a major cost, in a major risk to Israel's survival and, and, and security. And, so, and, they, and they, of course, ignored all the warnings. and all the, So the, the idea that somehow they will not 
they will not have to pay for the mistakes that they've done over the last 10 months. By the way, in the media, the reckoning has already begun, big time. The rest of the system is not going to deal with this as long as the fighting is taking place and as long as nobody, nobody has come up with a solution to what Israel is going to do with Gaza. But after that, after even some measure of stability, of course there'll be major, major reckoning. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting uh, question. I mean, because Israel today is so different from Israel in 1973, it's a legitimate question to ask whether, in fact, um, Israelis, the kinds of Israelis who vote for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Ben Gvir and Smotrich would actually punish them for this, given what their, the electoral alternatives are. But we so, saw that, by the way, after 73, it was the same. I mean, in the end of the day, labor was able to form some kind of a government, yeah. but three years later, they paid, and Likud came to power. Yeah. And all the public opinion polls already show that out of the 120 members of Knesset, that they are now, the, the coalition has 64 members, that if elections were held today, 53, 54 is maximum what they would have. Yeah. Okay, we have very little time left. Please, ma'am. Hello, thank you for coming and speaking with us. Professor Talhami said that nothing justifies the Israeli government decimating Gaza and causing thousands of Gazan deaths, my, which I agree with wholeheartedly. It sounds like the whole panel agreed with that wholeheartedly. My question is coming from my position as an American taxpayer. Why is it that when we know that nothing justifies Israeli government's actions in Gaza, quoting the panel again, um, why is it that the U.S. continues to fund billions of dollars into Israel, even now when Israel has told one million Gazans to leave the north? Like, what the heck are we doing as a country? I'm trying to make sense of why are we funding this even now. Thank you so much. Thank you. So can I also take the other questions so that we can, so question about why the U.S. Uh, uh, continues to support the state of Israel. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for coming out today and having this conversation. Uh, the posture of most diplomatic conversations is that Palestinian government governments do not act in good faith, but in fact, the Israeli government has repeatedly failed to uphold international peace treaties. Uh, such actions include allowing illegal settlements to expand. Uh, such examples of violate, violated agreements include the Oslo Accord, Camp David Summit, and the Taba Summit, to name a few. Does Israel need to be held accountable for also acting in violation with agreed norms? Thank you. Okay. And let's take one more question over here. Hi, my name is Barack. I'm from Israel. Um, I have uh, dozens of uh, relatives and friends and people I know who were directly harmed the past week. In World War II, Pearl Harbor sent the American army into war against the Nazis, and America paid with 400,000 lives um, to defeat the Nazis. I'm asking people on the panel, they were advisor to Israeli government as moderate Muslim Arabs, how do you suggest that Israel respond to a movement like Hamas, a terrorist organization that massacred innocent children, civilian and elderly, after the violation of our sovereignty and as women and children as their target? Is it fair for Israel to compare what the Americans did to ISIS in Mosul? What would you advise, what would be a just reaction for Israelis to protect their sovereignty? Thank you. Okay, so a lot of uh, questions there. So, well, my, my, my fundamental response is by having to get through the extremely dangerous period that this Hamas attack has caused not only between Gaza and Israel, but the region as a whole, which is having geopolitical implications beyond that, including the great powers of the world. containing it so that it doesn't become a regional war, and then really getting to the point where there are leaders who can work for a peaceful settlement. The only answer to your question is to resolve this issue through a peaceful settlement. Anything else is going to be temporary, it's going to be kicking the can down the road, and we're going to be here having a session like this again. So, so can I ask you, Shibley, just to f frame the question uh, a, a bit more provocatively, you know, well, obviously well, I think well, we're not provocative the, 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 the ambassador, <laughs> I think the ambassador is ultimately right that all conflicts have to end at some point in, in a negotiation. 
but it seems surpassingly unrealistic to me to think that you can have a negotiation at this point in time, given the mindset of Hamas as revealed by its behavior. And so the gentleman is asking, what would you have Israel do? Well, first of all, l let me just answer those first two questions related to what, uh, what could be done. Uh, let's have clarity, okay? So what I said was that um, nothing justifies targeting or recklessly endangering civilians, whether it's a just cause or retaliation, uh, just not justified. It doesn't mean that Israel has no right to self-defense. Everybody recognizes that it does. Uh, our president went and ta talked to the prime minister of Israel on day one when the Israelis felt ultra vulnerable when uh, they, they seemed helpless. They, they were watching to see the paradigm was completely disrupted about their security. Uh, that's that, that's a, uh, the, the expression of empathy that's important. That's when you hold hands, when you also assure and you say people have a right to self-defense. Self-defense doesn't mean you have the right to violate international law. We have rules. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you, you don't uh, 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 re show restraint in trying to save civilians. Uh, uh, so that's the, that's the thing that you have to do. And I, I think that one, uh, one of the things that I um, um, uh, sort of criticize our government posture so far is given this massive civilian casualties in, uh, in Gaza that we haven't said a word about restraint. We haven't said a word about uh, you know, international obligations on the international law, even if you, so there's a difference between, uh, you know, uh, self-defense and going beyond self-defense. Plus, it's hard to know with this Israeli government, you know, what is the objective? Is it really just self-defense or is it more, right? We know that in the Israeli government, there are people who say Gaza, quote, belongs to us and Palestinians should go somewhere else. Ben Gvir said that. Now, maybe he's not any more a factor in the decisions that are being made on the war. Uh, okay, that, that's a good thing. But we, we don't, we, we have, you know, there was, the Israeli people are not having confidence in, in their government right now. A, a, do we, do we, should we have complete trust that the right of self-defense gets a blank check uh, when in fact we need to, you know, it affects American interests. It's not just our own moral posture in the world, but ultimately it affects whether we get drawn in or not. And so do we want to give a blank check uh, on this issue uh, without weighing in? That's a mistake for the United States of America. Well, I will just say two things about this. Number one, I, I, I want to remind all of us of what Chibli said in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We're not here, when we say we're not, uh, we're not, talking about who's just and what's just and so on and so forth, and now we're try, not trying to, to, just, to justify right, anything. Yeah. We, that means also that we are not saying certain options are unjust and therefore they can. So we have to be a little consistent with what we say. That's, 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 that's number one. The number two is uh, we have to remember that international law, to the extent that they even apply to non-state actors, who maybe pretend to have had a state called Gaza, was not exactly adhered to last Saturday. And, and then that, and when, when, it, when, a, when a civilian population turns into a killing field, then it's not then, at, as of that point, what really works is not the head, but the anger, okay? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I agree that some of the Israeli reaction is the result of the fact that the scenes are so horrific that people are, are reacting for their, from their heart as yeah. much as from their minds. Now, finally, to the question of what can be done, what can Israel do? I think Israel can do something. I think Israel should, in, in fact, initiate. Now, a conversation with all the Arab states with which Israel has already established a, 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 a real relationship, which is, begins with Egypt and Jordan and, and the Abraham Accord states, and also with Saudi Arabia, about the issue of what can they, what can, what can Israel contribute to, 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 to essentially motivate them to come in, okay, and, and help with this issue, help with, it, with, with substituting, substituting for, for, for an entity that is resolved to, to destroy Israel. Israel cannot do, I stress again and again, it cannot do an Oslo with an organization that's still committed to Israel's destruction. 
Okay, we're, we're going to have to leave it there. We're already five minutes over time. Unfortunately, we're five minutes over time. And so I, I want to first say, I want to thank our panelists for sharing your wisdom. We probably could have gone uh, uh, five more hours. Um, I hope that we can count on you to uh, come back and, and help us understand this uh, conflict, although the other part of me hopes that that won't be necessary and that this conflict will end and that the people of Israel and Palestine and the broader region will finally get the peace that they deserve. I finally want to thank you, the audience. You've been a tremendous audience. You have really given all of us reason to be proud of the university tonight, and I very much hope uh, that we'll see you at other events that we will be holding to cover this important issue. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Thank you.